Okay, hello and welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us today for the webinar on COVID-19, gun sales, and most importantly, what can be done. Um, thank you all for taking the time to join us today. And um, we, we welcome your questions. Just a, an idea of how this is going to work. Um, the panelists will each speak for five to seven minutes. And um, at any time during this conversation, if you have questions, please use the chat function to enter your, your questions. And at the end, um, I will ask questions of the panel or specific individuals. Um, my name is Kyle Ann Hunter. I am the Vice President of Programs for Brady. I am joined by Mike Anestis, who is the incoming Executive Director of the New Jersey Center for Gun Violence Prevention. Ruth Glenn, who is the CEO of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Igor Volsky, who's the Executive Director of Guns Down, Guns Down America. Um, Kelly Sampson, who is the Counsel for Consti uh, Constitutional Litigation of our Legal Alliance and Racial Justice at Brady. And Tatiana Washington, who is on the Executive Council for Team Enough. Um, and just one quick, um, Correction, there's a Q&A function, not the chat function, that you should be using for your, your questions throughout this time. Um, first, before we get started, I wanted to recognize that this is Public Health Week right now, and on behalf of myself, all the panelists, and our organizations wanted to give a sincere and heartfelt thank you to every public health professional out there who is working on the, the front lines. Um, COVID-19 is something that is impacting every single one of us and uh, the work that you are all, all doing is um, amazing and we, we thank you and uh, hope coming out of this everyone has a, a much deeper respect for what our public health professionals do every single day. So a huge thank you um, on behalf of all of us. So let's jump right in. Um, as I said, I'm Kyle Ann Hunter, Vice President for Programs, and I'm going to spend a few minutes here setting the stage about what the, the issue is that we are confronting right now and uh, what we can actually do about it. Uh, COVID-19 has created not only medical issues, but unprecedented social change in our community right now. We have kids that are at home from school. Um, we have families sheltering in, in place. Um, and we have a lot of fear and uncertainty around our physical security, economic security, and food security going forward. As a result of that, that fear, that uncertainty, the, the chaos that we are feeling, we have also seen a huge rise in, in gun sales um, during this time. Igor is going to speak uh, more explicitly about what that rise actually is. But as a consequence, what we know is that there are more guns in the home today than there were before the COVID outbreak started. And that in introduces the risk of family fire. Family fire is a shooting involving a improperly stored or misused gun found in the home. Incidences can include suicides, unintentional shootings or intentional shootings. And with more guns in the home, it is more important than ever that we talk about solutions that we can all do right now, ways that we can fight this epidemic during the pandemic. So why are we concerned with family fire as an issue at this moment? Before COVID even started, there were more than 4.6 million children in the United States that were living in homes that had access to unlocked and loaded guns. As a result of this, every day, eight kids were unintentionally shot with guns that were found in the home. We know that there is a 300% increase in the likelihood that someone will die by suicide when they have an unlocked and loaded gun in the home. And that three quarters of kids know where these guns are that are in the home. We now find ourselves in this unprecedented time of social disruption, where kids are home while parents are trying to work from home at the same time, meaning that you don't have the same sort of, of access to your kids and knowing what your kids are actually doing. We know that depression, isolation um, is, a, is a larger concern. And we also know that there are people who are, who are quarantined, who are at home with 
individuals who have been abusive, whether it is physically abusive, uh, emotionally abusive, or economically abusive, and the increased presence of guns, plus the increased uh, a risk that we are feeling of, of uncertainty, can lead to deadly consequences. And so today we want to talk about solutions, ways that we can all continue to advocate for gun violence prevention while we are, we are at home. And one of the, the simplest ways of things that we can do is, is through our, our four-part and family fire moniker here of ask, act, talk, and learn. So when you are calling and checking in on your friends, it's something we are all doing quite a bit more right now. In addition to just asking them how they're doing, ask them if they have a gun in the home. Ask them if they have recently purchased a gun. And more importantly, ask them about how they are storing that gun and, what, and how they are considering the risks that bringing that gun into their home might pose. Act. If you yourself are a gun owner or have a family member who is a gun owner, act responsibly. Store the gun, load it, or unloaded and locked and with the ammunition stored, stored separately. Set the good example. Talk. Have these conversations with your family. Talk about where additional signs of stress, uncertainty, fear might be coming from. Talk about alternatives to, to guns that might be a better means of, of protection for them. And talk openly about how this time is changing your family and how you might need to take additional layers of protections if you have chosen to bring a gun into the home. And finally, learn. You're all doing that right now by learning about what some of these increased risks are and what you can do about them, but also take the time to learn about opportunities that you might have in your communities. Things like extreme risk protective orders and offsite storage um, that, that are very important at this time. So with that stage set, I'd like to next turn it over to Mike Anestis to talk about how some of the, the risks of guns in the home directly related to suicide are playing out during COVID-19. Thanks, Kai. So yeah, I'm here to talk to you guys specifically about suicide. And there are really four primary questions I want to try to get to in the short little window I have to speak to you. And the first is, you know, why talk about suicide during this pandemic? The second, why would firearms be relevant to that conversation. The third being, why does any of that make sense? But the fourth, where I really want to focus is what can we do? Given the situation we're in, what are some simple steps that people in very sort of different environments can take to increase safety and lower the risk of suicide? And so the first question is, why talk about suicide? And the reality is there's just a lot of aspects of life during the pandemic that make people feel more misery, increased social isolation, uncertainty about finances and jobs, and just stress. And all of those aspects of life make people feel the distress associated with thinking about suicide more often. But that doesn't speak specifically to guns, which is my second question. And Kai already got at this a little bit. But the reality is more than half of all suicides in this country are gun deaths. And almost two out of every three gun deaths in this country is a suicide death. So these topics are intertwined. And so when you have a gun surge during a, a pandemic, the concern then is that risk goes up. Not only are people more isolated and stressed, they also have increased access to a method that has a, chi a high chance of causing the death if they were to use it. Um, and the, the important thing to keep in mind is that as the pandemic hopefully passes before too long, those firearms remain in the home. And so what you have is a surge that's going to have a long lasting effect on suicide risk across the population, even when our attention goes off of the current pandemic. So then the third question is, why are these things related? And often the, the pushback when you talk about firearms and suicide is, why are you talking about this and not depression? Why are you talking about this aspect of the problem? The reality is owning or possessing or acquiring a firearm does not make someone suicidal. So I don't think anybody here is trying to blame suicide entirely on firearms. But what firearms do is they make suicidal people, people far more likely to die. As Kai noted earlier, 300%, and I've seen that number much higher, particularly if the firearms stored them safely. So something to keep in mind that people lose sight of is that suicide is hard. The vast majority of folks who think about it never attempt, and the vast majority of folks who attempt never die. In fact, 70% of folks who attempt suicide and survive that attempt never try again. So second chances matter a lot, but the problem is with firearms, 85 to 95% of folks who make a suicide attempt die compared to less than 5% of all other methods. So they almost never get that chance. So here in COVID with the gun surge, what you, have, what you have is an increased access to firearms. 
and a greater likelihood then that people who are feeling great misery then have ready access to a tool that actually has a great likelihood of causing their death, whereas any other method they might use would be less likely to do that. So risk is fundamentally changed. So with my last couple of minutes, what I, what I wanna talk about is what can we do? And there are a few things on the sort of larger sort of government side of things, we can enforce the, the regulations and legislation that currently exists that has some evidence that can prevent suicide. So things like enforcing extreme risk protection orders, providing an avenue through which if somebody does not want to temporarily remove access, there's a possibility for doing that. For clinicians, assess for firearm access, talk to your clients, whether through telehealth or face-to-face, -face, however you're seeing them, but check in, check in on this. Even if you're uncomfortable with the topic, this might be the single greatest tool for saving lives. But the primary focus for the advice I want to give is speaking to gun owners themselves or the friends and family and loved ones of gun owners about what they can say and do while respecting rights and culture, but really lowering risk. And again, Kai alluded to some of these things, but the main ideas are store your firearm unloaded, store it separate from ammunition and store it in a locked location, like a gun safe or a lock box. Consider storing it temporarily, legally, and voluntarily away from home during times of stress. Um, now, what's legal is going to vary from state to state. What's plausible during social distancing is going to be questionable. And so you can also get creative. Give your spouse the firing pin. Take the key to a cable lock and freeze it in a block of ice so that if you're having a stressful moment, you can't just reach and grab it. There are solutions where you may have to adapt in the moment you're in that still offer a lot of the same protections, again, without causing someone to have to announce themselves as suicidal or having to give up their rights. There are plenty of ways to keep yourself safe. And so that's the last point, last point I wanna come back to. I keep talking about safe storage and that means something different to a lot of folks. And what I respect and understand is a lot of folks acquire firearms arms in times like this and outside of this with the idea that this is gonna increase my safety and my family's safety in the home. And so I wanna have one loaded on the ready. And, and I'm not here to argue with you about numbers on this, but what I wanna say is that there's a continuum of safety and there are ways that you can increase your sort of safe storage or decrease the ready access without getting so far away from how you currently have it stored that you're not comfortable, that you can, you can manage both these risks. And so the hope is that we can shift towards a social norm in which firearm owners understand and appreciate the risk for suicide that comes with firearm access. So that as we make our decisions and balance the pros and cons, we keep that in mind. So I'll look forward to your questions and pass it off to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Mike. And um, I now want to turn it over to Ruth Glenn, who's going to talk about how this increase in guns is related to. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Kai. And um, I really appreciate being a part of this because I think this issue around increased gun sales and increased calls uh, for support for domestic violence survivors is really indicative of what we might see as a real public health crisis, not that we're not in one currently, but another type of public health crisis. So um, given all of that, this is the perfect opportunity to talk about some of the things that we're concerned about, some of the things that we're seeing, and some of the things that we hope will change as we move through this very difficult time. Um, I'd like to also mention um, that I am a survivor of, of firearms and domestic violence. I was, I was shot many years ago and left for dead. So I come to this with a personal perspective and certainly a professional perspective. Um, and I hope that that, that lends to the conversation. Um, we know, for instance, that every month in this country, on average, 53 women lose their lives to the deadly risks of domestic violence and fire harms. Um, my, my thing, our, our perspective is that zero is what we're aiming for, right? And in a time like this, when we know that um, there's increased gun sales and that there's also an increase in regards to abusers' abilities to manipulate, coerce, and control their victims, that we're, we're seeing a real complex um, mix and integrated mix that can be very deadly for um, victims and survivors of domestic violence who are now trapped in the home whereas they may have been able to get out before. They have their children in the home with them, those that they have to make sure are safe themselves. 
Um, and they may have already been experiencing an abuser with a gun, right? Um, we, we are very well aware that many abusers have a gun in the home already. Um, and if they haven't had one before, the access to get one now is even easier. And I'd like to remind all of us that um, gun violence and domestic violence, when they're mixed, doesn't always end up lethal, right? Um, when you're isolated um, in the home with your perpetrator and they've been using the firearm to manipulate and control you, all I have to do is pull the trigger. Um, that can be very, very frightening. And when we're in this period of time when we don't necessarily have the resources for anyone, let alone uh, diminished resources for those who might be calling for safety and help, that's a real problem. Um, we have uh, recognized that we are slowly beginning to get an increase in hotline calls across the nation in um, different communities. Um, we have not yet been able to um, measure what those calls look like when they involve firearms, but I guarantee you that will come out eventually, right? Um, I also want to remind us that um, many times survivors are trapped in the home with an abuser, with that gun that they've been able to acquire even after COVID um, and they can't, they can't call law enforcement. So I get really concerned when we talk about reporting um, because that, that implies that law enforcement is the information where they're getting the information. Well, many survivors are suffering uh, without calling uh, for help and particularly during this time because it's so frightening. Um, I want you all to just think for a, a moment that an abuser is, is uh, letting the survivor know if you leave um, I'll shoot you in the back. Um, and we've heard stories such as that. So our, our position is that we have got to do more about uh, enforcing our federal laws around uh, domestic violence, abusers having weapons and firearms, right? We have to ask anyone that can that it is not an essential time um, to, to purchase a firearm. And if, if it is, then we need to make sure that they've passed the background check, that they don't have any kind of DV in their history, and that we do all that we can to ensure that survivors are safe from firearms. And then last but not least, um, I want us to also caution that, um, this came up the other day, um, we never advocate um, that a victim or survivor themselves um, should get a firearm unless they've had the appropriate training, which you all have already alluded to, you know, and, and knowing how to store and those kinds of things. Um, because we also know that it's far more likely that that gun would be used against them. Um, the other thing that we've been doing is just um, filling the calls. Um, we are not a hotline, but we have been filling calls from survivors and, and service providers who are very concerned about um, how this is impacting them, what can they do, and um, how can we help them make sure that um, abusers don't have access um, to firearms. And that's mostly come from our DV programs, which is fascinating because remember, um, when an abuser has a firearm, it's not just the victim that's at risk, right? We've heard stories in the past of, of um, and in fact, we've, we lost an advocate a few years ago where an abuser followed her and um, you know, um, committed the most heinous act. So we're, we're helping uh, DB programs around not just the firearms issues, but all of the issues that COVID are, are presenting, but including the firearms and how to protect themselves as an entity um, as we move forward. So I too welcome any questions um, that you all might have and thank you for this time. Thank you so much, Ruth. And thank you for everyone who is um, entering questions. We will get to all of them at the end after we have um, everybody. So please, please keep those questions coming. Um, next, I want to kick it over to Igor, who's going to give us a more in-depth overview, um, really by the numbers, what we've been seeing throughout March in particular, um, as we've been sheltering in place um, and more of this emergency sense around COVID-19 has come up. So Igor, over to you. 
Thanks so much, Kai, and, and thank you all for being a part of this conversation. Uh, we really started seeing local news reports about uh, very long lines in front of gun stores all across the country um, in early March, starting around March 11th, March 12th, with a particularly large spike around March 13th and 14th, which is when the president declared a state of emergency. And what became clear is that you saw an influx of people buying guns, some number of them, although we don't know uh, how many, are first time gun uh, buyers. And what they told reporters, what they told uh, gun dealers is that they were purchasing a firearm for the first time really for three different reasons, or maybe all the reasons are uh, mix in some way. Uh, the first is really the fear that folks have that society will crumble as a result of the virus. Uh, the second is the fear that as police officers uh, become ill and are taken off the force that maybe response times will slow in certain areas. Uh, and the third is the fear uh, of some of the individuals who are now being uh, released from prison. I think all of them who are being released are nonviolent offenders, um, but that is uh, creating fear um, in, in some people. Um, and add on top of that, uh, that as all of these reports started coming out, uh, the NRA um, and the lobby for the gun industry, the trade association for the gun industry, uh, began to very aggressively uh, both publicly and privately urge people to buy guns. Uh, they argued that now was the time that guns are essential. And they began lobbying governors and, and the Trump administration to deem gun stores essential as uh, different areas of the country went under lockdown. Um, and so what we now know um, according to the FBI, is that in the month of March, uh, we saw about two and a half million background checks that were run at federally licensed dealers. Um, this uh, doesn't represent direct purchases. We don't have that kind of data. But what we do know is uh, the number of checks uh, that were run at federally licensed dealers. We don't have any data, unfortunately, on how many private sales were, were conducted for the most part. Um, and if you look at those numbers, what it really says to us uh, is that in, uh, in March of 2020, we sold about a, over a million more guns than we did this time last year. A lot of the data around gun sales is seasonal, and so it's helpful to look at uh, where we were last year. So that's a pretty significant spike, right? Over a million more guns, roughly, uh, were sold this month than in March of, of 2019. And as everyone uh, has said so far, this is incredibly concerning. Um, it's incredibly concerning, as Michael said about suicide, as Ruth said about domestic violence. And I will also add, it's incredibly concerning uh, about unintentional uh, shootings and incidents that could happen in the home, especially as uh, certainly children uh, are now at home. And we know of at least one case um, that happened, I think, around March 17th in New Mexico, uh, where, as, as Kai was saying, um, an individual uh, bought a gun, panic bought a gun in the midst of, of this kind of hysteria, uh, brought it home, uh, and then ended up unintentionally shooting and killing his 13-year-old cousin. Um, because he didn't realize the gun was, was loaded. So if you're gonna buy a gun, knowing how to actually use that gun and store that gun is incredibly important. Um, we've also been tracking reports from all around the country of pretty significant spikes in domestic violence calls, as Ruth mentioned. Um, and what we know um, is in at least 36 different states, uh, or 56 or 56 or 58 cities or counties in the United States that they've experienced a spike um, in either calls to hotlines um, for domestic violence and suicide um, or calls to police departments uh, about those matters. So those are also um, fairly significant increases. 
And of course, then the, the question becomes, well, what, what can we do, right? What can all of you do uh, who are watching uh, to help really slow down uh, this stockpiling of weapons? And I think you could really do two different things. Um, the first is you could urge your governor to extend the uh, period of time that it takes to complete a background check to ensure that no sales go through without a completed background check. You could urge your governor to increase uh, funding for domestic violence programs, for suicide prevention programs, for community-based violence intervention programs in communities um, where, uh, where folks on the ground are doing such important work to communities that are most impacted um, by gun violence. And then I think the second thing you can do is really use, use your voice, use your digital voice uh, to urge folks in, in your social networks not to panic buy guns, to point out to them uh, the dangers that, that lie with that and, and the simple fact that when you panic buy a gun, uh, you may be bringing something into your house that's even more deadly uh, than, than the coronavirus. And we uh, have put up some resources at uh, stopthecoronavirusgunsurge.org uh, that folks can go to um, and, and take action that way. All right. Thank you so much, Igor. Um, and just an announcement for everyone, all of the materials that you're seeing, the slides, fact sheets, handouts, those will all be available um, after, as will a recording of this webinar to use the information or revisit it. Um, also, for questions, we're going to try to answer as many as we can after um, the panelists go, but please follow uh, Brady Buzz on Twitter for anything uh, additional information that there might be. Um, and with that, I wanna kick it over to Kelly, who's going to talk about some of the uh, racial justice consequences from this that we might be seeing. Thanks, Kai. Um, and I actually, I'm gonna be talking a lot about the um, kind of constitutional framework and then Tatiana is gonna uh, come in and talk about the racial justice aspects. Um, and I can't see any of you, but if you could just do me a favor and play along and raise your hand at home if you think that Wayne LaPierre is better suited to direct our response to COVID-19 than Dr. Fauci. So I can't see any of you, but I'd be willing to bet that no one raised their hand because as you all know, COVID-19 is a public health crisis that requires a public health response. And all of the public health experts are telling us that the best way to stop the spread of this virus is for everyone to stay home if they can stay at home. And in response to that, governors have ordered non-essential businesses to close. And sometimes they've included gun stores on those lists. And regardless of what you think about guns or the Second Amendment, I just want to remind everyone that there are some very rational reasons why a governor would choose to deem a gun store non-essential. And namely, it's because gun sales necessarily happen in person. You have to be at the store. You have to fill out paperwork. You have to handle the weapon. And these are the sorts of tactile transactions that could spread the virus. So. With that being said, lots of governors have responded by adding gun stores along with bookstores and shoe stores and all sorts of businesses to the list of non-essential businesses. And yet many gun rights activists have characterized that decision as gun grabbing or trying to take freedom. And to be clear, Brady would say that they're wrong for a couple of key reasons. First and foremost, because the Second Amendment means something and it's not a free for all. And we know that because in 2008, the Supreme Court decided the Heller case, which established that the Second Amendment encompasses an individual right to keep a gun in the home for self-defense, but also made it clear that that right is not unlimited and that longstanding regulations on all sorts of things, including commercial sales, are acceptable. In other words, the Second Amendment coexists with regulation. So the question when it comes to COVID-19 is, are, is deeming gun stores non-essential, the sort of acceptable regulation that falls under the Second Amendment. 
And the Supreme Court hasn't addressed this question yet because we're in the middle of a hopefully once in a lifetime pandemic, but circuit courts, which are the next highest authority, and in a lot of cases, the final authority, have considered issues that give us a good understanding of how these sorts of um, decisions would fall. And circuit courts have held that there's not an absolute right to sell firearms. And they've constantly upheld cases that indicate that you don't have the right to immediately obtain a firearm. A good example of that is waiting periods where courts have consistently over and over held that waiting periods don't violate the Second Amendment. And in a lot of ways, deeming gun stores non-essential during the you know, time of a crisis, it's akin to a waiting, a waiting period. And so while we haven't yet had cases at the Supreme Court level, we think there's a pretty good chance that given that it's established precedent that there's not an immediate right to buy a fire, firearm and that you don't have the immediate right to obtain a firearm, that these sorts of decisions probably don't violate the Second Amendment. But for the sake of this argument, let's assume that there is some sort of implication around the Second Amendment right with these gun closures that still wouldn't make them unconstitutional because states have always had the authority to use um, their police powers to impose good faith, generally applicable limitations on otherwise constitutional activity. And the fact that I'm sitting at home right now is a good indication of what that looks like. We all know that in any ordinary time, I would have the First Amendment right to go in front of the White House with 500 of my closest friends and protest. But I can't do that right now because I'm under a stay at home order. In other words, my constitutional rights are kind of limited right now for the duration of this, this crisis. And the Second Amendment isn't special. It's not a unique right in that sense. And the government does have the authority during this period to make good faith, rational um, emergency measures. Now, the one thing that they can't do is single out guns. So if a governor were to say, you know what, I'm keeping everything open, except for gun stores because I just really don't like guns. That would be questionable, but that's not what we're seeing. What we're seeing is governors taking a look at the whole scope of businesses and society and deciding which businesses are essential to keep us functioning and which ones we need to pause for now in order to stop the spread of a deadly virus. So with all that being said, you might be wondering what's up with this DHS um, guidance. So as some of you probably know, a couple of weeks ago, the Department of Homeland Security issued guidance urging um, governments to consider gun stores, whether they're retail or serving defense as a central critical infrastructure. And that's a change because in the past, that would only apply to gun dealers and gun manufacturers that serve defense clients or police departments. And so we're wondering, what is the rationale for this? So what Brady's done is we filed a Freedom of Information Act demanding that the administration turn over all documents and emails and communications showing why they made this choice. Because we have a good reason to believe that this was not a public health decision, but that this was the result of pressure from the gun lobby, as Igor mentioned earlier. And so just to close, um, we at Brady are you know, doing our best to understand and push back on the gun industry, putting its profits over public safety. Um, and you all can do that in your communities too. Um, if you see gun stores, um, you can kind of keep an eye on what is happening in your state. And if, you know, your governor has in the interest of public health decided to list gun stores as not essential, um, you know, please lend your voice to speaking up and supporting them. Um, through letters to the editor or using your digital voice as a way to just sort of um, bolster that. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Right, thank you so much, Kelly. And now to kick it over to Tatiana to talk about the um, impact of some of this on impacted communities as well as the youth engagement aspect. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, my name's Tatiana, I'm from Milwaukee, which is right now where the most cases of coronavirus is currently Wisconsin, um, and it is disproportionately affecting Black people. I think it's 81% of coronavirus deaths are Black people, and it's in Milwaukee, where I'm from. Um, but with that being said, communities like in Milwaukee have been under a state of emergency for years. Um, children have been scared or unable to go outside and play or go to school, walk to the grocery store without living in fear of being shot. Um, so I just want everyone to keep in mind that while there is a pandemic happening, 
there is this ongoing epidemic of gun violence that is happening in this country and will continue to happen. And now with the stay at home orders, what we're seeing is an extra police presence in communities. And like I said before, Milwaukee, um, coronavirus is disproportionately affecting Black people. And so we're going to see an increase of police presence in Black neighborhoods because I think it, here you have to be home by 8.30. So with that being said, we're gonna, we're, this is going to affect people experiencing homelessness. Um, the trauma that young Black children go through, seeing police and just that trauma on top of the fact of COVID-19 happening right now. Um, and it, it, it's, it's just really scary right now because when you think of the fact of without a pandemic going on, Black people can't even sit inside of their homes without being shot by police. Um, so I'm, I'm really worried about what will happen as states decide to give people tickets out who are outside after curfew. I mean, we've seen recently that someone wearing a, a black person wearing a mask got kicked out of Walmart. So all these implications that are happening, that this is, this is a, this is about racism too. This is about ageism. This is about classism. This is about ableism. We just saw in Milwaukee or in Wisconsin, the election that we had on Tuesday, that was definitely shouldn't have happened. People were outside for hours during a pandemic, not six feet apart. Um, and lastly, I want to bring up the impact of COVID-19 on incarcerated people. We've seen um, the unhygienic conditions already that occur in prisons, but now with a pandemic going on um, and no access to care. So all these issues really do intersect. Um, but I do want to say that people should not be discouraged while we're at home. We should still get involved from home. Um, fighting against gun violence, I think people really underestimate the power of social media. I'm a Gen Zer, so I really, like I grew up with social media um, and people underestimate the power that you can have by sharing a post or posting something about gun violence. Encourage people to phone bank for a local candidate that, um, it's, that cares about gun violence prevention. You know, make, do, go volunteer digitally for a local gun violence prevention organization. Just because we're at home right now doesn't mean we should stop fighting. Um, donate to local grassroots organizations that are doing uh, gun violence prevention work and impact the communities. There's so many ways to get involved. And just because we're at home and because this pandemic is happening, gun violence doesn't stop. So everyone should keep getting involved. Thank you um, so much, Tatiana. And so um, we want to turn now to some of your questions. And if you notice, we have, thanks to um, some great moderators that, that I have helping me, we are combining some questions that are around the same sort of theme. And so if you don't hear your question word for word, but get the, get the gist of it, um, it's so in the interest of time. And again, if uh, you don't hear, if, you're, if you have a burning question that doesn't get answered in this time, um, please make sure you follow Brady Buzz on Twitter and we'll try to, to get to as many as we can there um, as well. So I want to kick it off with a question around this idea of new gun surges and purchases. And there's a question that um, aren't most new gun purchases by households that have already had guns. So is the risk of family fire really raised as well as combining it with a question around that given social distancing, um, can we assume that gun owners aren't getting training? Um, so I wanna combine these two and um, Igor touched on this uh, a little bit in his talking points around the, the NICS background checks. Um, anecdotally, we have heard from a lot of first time gun buyers or first time gun buyers that this really is a first time. It's a reaction to this fear, whether it is a fear of economic collapse, a fear of looting or raiding, or just a fear of an unknown. And they've bought into this idea that if I have a gun, I'm, I'm somehow going to be safer. But I think really to one of the, the most important points here is around the fact that in many places, gun dealers are being de deemed essential, while gun uh, ranges where most of the training places take place are being considered as indoor recreation and therefore closed. And so this really does create often a, a double bind. As someone who's been around guns a good portion of my, my life, 
proper training is absolutely essential. And I think one of the things that we see for risks of family fire, even if it is a family that has had guns before, they're bringing in a new gun that they don't have the opportunity to familiarize themselves with. And so there's going to be, in addition to the suicide risk increase, the domestic violence risk increase, the risk of unintentional shootings from not actually knowing how to use that tool is going to be greatly increased as well. So when you add stress plus the unknown, you have a, a huge increase in family fire, both in terms of the fact that we anecdotally are seeing a lot of first-time gun owners, as well as the fact that people aren't able to actually become familiarized with this new very, very, very risky tool that they're bringing into their homes. Um, anybody else on the panel care to engage on that one? Mike? Yeah, I guess just on the point of, you know, let's say for the sake of argument that most of the purchases are by folks who already own firearms. I guess what I would say in response to that is if you are acquiring a new firearm motivated by fear during a time of stress in a pandemic, how you're going to store that firearm, how you're going to think about that firearm might not be the same as the ones you previously owned. And so in the, in the case of suicide, people, folks tend to have owned their firearm for more than a decade before they die with it. But if you're bringing a new firearm in, during a time of stress, and this is a tool being used to combat this fear you have about the present situation, that does not make that purchase redundant. If it's being done in a different way, that matters. And I'll, I'll also just add quickly that uh, we've also heard anecdotally from gun dealers that they themselves, some of them are concerned about these first time gun buyers not knowing how to use the weapon. Um, and so some uh, gun dealers uh, have really kind of helped uh, these folks figure out how to do that before they buy the weapons, give them a quick course about how to use it at the store dur during the actual purchase. Um, and I think it just really underscores um, this, this concern that I guess everybody has um, about folks buying really deadly tools and then not knowing how to use them safely. Great. Um, next question on any data on the sale of locks or safes. I haven't seen anything. Does anyone have any? Um, this is one that historically is very hard to track because it's, they could be purchased from anywhere and you don't need a background check, but it's absolutely important and we'll, we'll keep an eye on, on any, anything we can get on that. Um, a, a really good one, and, and um, I think Ruth and Mike really want to kick this one to you too. Um, if we're afraid for a loved one that we are socially distanced from right now, being at a heightened risk for suicide or domestic violence, what is the one best thing that any one of us can do right now? Uh, Ruth, if you want to go ahead and take this one first. Um, the one best thing, whether it's during this time or not, but, but particularly because it's during this time, is to do everything that we can to ensure to whatever we um, abide by stay at home, abide by uh, self-isolating, whatever the terms are that we're using, that we still make sure to reach out to that person and say, is there anything that I can do for you? We do not advise um that a victim or survivor try to get rid of the gun we don't have uh, firearm we don't advise that anyone that knows that there's a firearm in the home try to get rid of it um if it becomes an imminent danger then of course you know we need to have law enforcement intervene um but it, it's just having the ability to say to someone if you feel like something is going to happen as a result of the firearm please don't hesitate to reach out or do whatever you can, um, and I will be for you here for you. You know when you need it, um, and/or reach out to their community re uh, domestic violence program. Mike, sure. Yeah, I, I know you asked for one thing, but I think I still have to split it into two. There's really two things to do. One is you can work to make that person you feel is at risk for suicide, have less desire. And the simplest way to do that is make them feel connected, talk to them, uh, let them know they matter, speak openly about your concern for them because you're not gonna put the thought in their head by expressing your concern about that. So that can make them want to less. The second half of it is more related to the firearm. Have a conversation with them about what they are comfortable doing to make it less accessible and why. But remember that you can't prescribe a behavior and say you have to do this. 
people don't respond to say, look what you're doing, change it. That's not a way to change behavior. That's putting the weight of the, wor the world on your shoulders and in a way that sets you up to fail. Um, work with that person's individual values and circumstances to find anywhere along that spectrum of safety that they're willing to move. Thank you so much, Mike and, and Ruth for that. I'm going to change tax a little bit, and there have been several questions around this rise of hate rhetoric and hate crimes against uh, Asian Americans that we're seeing right now. Um, so really two tacks uh, about this. Um, one is anecdotally any evidence around Asian Americans purchasing guns for the first times out of fear of a rising hate crime. And the other tack these questions were taking was, are there are there any are there any correlations we're seeing right now between the surge of gun purchases and an increase in hate crimes towards towards Asian Americans? So um, we'll open that one up for discussion now for anyone who wants to talk. And Igor, I'm sure you you have some thoughts on this one. Um, I'll just say that Kai, you're right. It's all anecdotal. So we've seen reports uh, about gun stores in heavily Asian communities experiencing an uptick in Asian customers and what those Asian customers have told those gun sellers that it's because uh, they have anxiety and fear about potential hate crimes that are connected to COVID. Um, we haven't yet seen an uptick in hate crimes, however, using guns um, against Asian Americans. Uh, at least I haven't seen um, that kind of reporting or that kind of data. Mm -hmm. And, and I think just one more thing that's going to be important to continue to look at, if we look at some of the, the past of, of hate crimes and guns, is, you know, again, this, this continual refrain that we see is that, you know, guns in the hands of one who wants to commit a hate crime often makes it much more likely that they, they will, just because of some of the, the power that people feel when they, they have a gun. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a concern that we definitely want to, to track in one of the uh, potential negative second and third order, order effects that's going to last for a very long time um, as a result of this. Um, let's see, one, one question I think that's good for, for everyone here is, you, do you think the media is covering this issue as well as it, as it should be? It sort of waxes and wanes in coverage. And so we can get everyone a magic wand. Um, how would you think that this, this story should be better covered? And Kelly, actually, I, I'm interested in some of your thoughts from a, a legal aspect when it's been very much of just a, well, they're, they're essential versus not essential. Do you think the media should be doing something more in how they're actually talking about this? Um, I think, one thing if I could wave a magic wand is for people to, um, when they're writing about this, a lot of times some of the articles that I've seen kind of pose it as, you know, NRA challenges Governor X, um, you know, for violating guns or something like that. And I think um, to rem always contextualize it and talk about what gun sales actually are, number one, because it is a unique sort of transaction. And I mean, Eeyore mentioned it where you have people going to gun stores and the gun dealer is trying to help them understand how to use the weapon. So it's not the sort of thing where you can go to a coffee shop and maybe they do curbside pickup. Like that, that's just illegal. So I think to provide more context around gun sales and what they actually are and how they defer, but then also to, um, in the same vein of context to point out that it's not as though governors are going around and targeting guns or targeting the second amendment but they are looking at the whole scope of their state and the cities in it figuring out what they can do to stop the spread of the virus and then making rules around that and i think sometimes the way the articles are written it's like you know governor goes after gun stores, but really, I mean, it's governor going after the virus. And that means that there's a whole scope of um, businesses that close. And people know that, but I think sometimes when you look at it in a vacuum, it can seem like guns are at the heart of this when they really aren't. It's a, it's totally kind of like on the side of what they're actually trying to do. So. 
Yeah, and to, to build off of that, you know, a lot of the coverage around the actual health pieces of coronavirus has actually been quite good, right? You had reporters listen to health experts and report that information to the public. Um, and I really wish they would do, it in, do that in this case as well. Um, because on the gun issue, there's almost unanimous agreement in all of the research uh, that when you bring a gun into the home that you raise uh, the risk to suicide, to domestic violence incidents, to unintentional shootings. I mean, that's almost unanimous. Yet in the coverage, um, that unanimity is not reflected. Um, and so I, I just wish that just like we're listening to public health experts about how best to stop the spread of corona, that we also would listen to those, in many cases, same experts about the dangers of panic buying guns. Thanks. Um, I want to turn now to some of the questions around legislative solutions that we can be working for and petitioning for, um, both in terms of, you know, we have the essential, not essential, but even beyond that, um, things like extreme risk protective orders that ensuring that they continue, um, ensuring that um, background checks have enough time to actually go through and process. Um, laws around domestic abuse and ensuring that uh, their law enforcement offices are still able to actually respond to calls and those are deemed, deemed essential. So I uh, want to divide this up into to three parts to, to look at this. And again, I'm combining a whole bunch of people's questions here. Um, one, are there any new laws that people at home should be advocating for right now um, as a result of this? Two, are there any existing laws or policies on the books that we should be um, pressing our local officials to ensure deem essential and that law enforcement actually um, continues to engage with? And three, how do we ensure that any of these new laws that we are, are petitioning for or the ways in which we're looking for laws to be implemented don't have unintended consequences that disproportionately impacted communities that are already impacted by, by gun violence. So um, let's start with, with one here. Any new laws that you think that we should be advocating for right now? Okay. Ruth, yep. Yes, um, so advocating for uh, the reauthorization of VAWA would be really helpful when, it, when it's time to do that. Um, we have uh, made sure that current um, firearms laws in relation to domestic abuse remained, but then were also strengthened. Um, and by strengthened, I mean more extensive background checks and all of those things that would prevent an abuser from har harming his victim or having access to a weapon. Um, so when we're looking into the future, when and if uh, uh, the Violence Against Women Act um, comes back up, I, I hope that our listeners and and everyone will advocate for that. And not just from the perspective of gun violence prevention but to, and, and domestic violence abuse, but um, overall, because it really has become an enhanced um, Violence Against Women Act. And that certainly is one piece of it that will further protect victims of domestic violence. Any, anyone else? Yeah, I'll... Um... Representative Gwen Moore has a bill out um, and it's a community de-escalation bill. And what it will do is give money to organizations that are doing de-escalation work um, in impacted communities. So like mentioning those unintentional consequences, um, but like this would help give those grants to these, these or this amazing organizations that already exist are doing great work um, to better do their work. and. So I think like things like that to address the root causes of violence um, is important to, to advocate for. Yeah, Tatiana, um, so just really quick, Tatiana makes, it, makes a great point. I mean, Congress is about to take up a fourth stimulus bill that's connected to, to coronavirus. Why shouldn't they include that kind of funding in that stimulus, particularly as we see in certain areas of the country, gun violence rates continue. Uh, and then doctors have to make this, these horrible decisions about do they take care of, of these gunshot victims or do they take care of, of the coronavirus patients? So absolutely, I think you should increase funding now 
um, to, the, to that kind of important on, on the ground work. And also, uh, we talked about making sure that every sale um, has, has a background check, of course, currently as it stands with federally licensed dealers. Um, but there's that loophole, right, that if uh, it can't be completed in three days, the background check, then the person gets the gun. That should be closed uh, and, and it can be closed permanently, in fact. Right. And, and I'd add the, the one more there too is around incentivizing um, and further requiring the sale of safe storage devices with gun sales um, as part of it. I think especially as we're seeing a rise in new gun owners, it's more important than ever. Um, we have the Prevent Family Fire Act right now that um, got a huge bipartisan support in the House to, to actually um, make it easier to sell safe storage devices, you know, and, and at a time when you're, you're seeing and you have people at home, it would discuss it's more important than ever. Um, so on that, that second part, though, what, what sort of laws and policies do we want to make sure are staying essential and law enforcement is um, engaged with? In the question and answers, ERPOs are coming up quite a bit. Um, it is Still too early for us to tell data-wise um, if there's, there's been a lag, but that's something that absolutely, if you're in a state that has an ERPO, um, ensuring that those still go forward is essential right now. Um, other other uh, laws or policies that folks might be less familiar with. Kelly? Uh, one of the things that um, we, that should remain essential is some states that have deemed gun stores essential have declined to um, deem them essential when it comes to inspection work. Um, and so that ends up creating this strange para like paradigm where the gun store can do business, but not necessarily cooperate with investigations um, and other programs that would help like reduce crime and also address crime that's happened. So um, I think that's one thing to be mindful for is if you're in a state that's deemed gun stores essential in terms of commerce, um, have they also been deemed essential in terms of their ability to um, help with investigations and inspections as well to make sure that they're following their own rules um, and abiding by ATF guidelines? Yeah, Mike? Yeah, so this isn't necessarily for a specific form of legislation, but I think one sort of underlying thing to keep in mind in all this, and I think Jeffrey Swanson's really influenced my thinking on this the most, which is to make sure that whenever people are talking about legislation they want to pursue, they don't conflate, at least on the suicide side of things, uh, the outcome with mental illness and focus legislation on specific populations. Um, the data doesn't support that that actually has the effect you want it to have. What it seems to do is, is increase stigma and decrease help-seeking behavior, which is obviously not what we want in a time of social, social isolation and increased stress, right? So effort should be focused on the population as, as a whole instead of, of sort of singling people out. And even with purpose, um, that's not about mental illness, that's about specific behaviors and then going through due process. That isn't about sort of tagging someone with a, a label and, and separating them from the group. Yeah. Ruth? Yeah, I, I think in response to COVID and um, uh, where we are right now, and particularly when it comes to domestic violence victims and survivors, is that um, we ensure that um, the federal background checks are implemented like they should be and continue to make sure that um, those who shouldn't don't have access to weapons. Um, courts and law enforcement should continue to provide access to emergency protective orders, and particularly right now, and expedite those so that there is safety. Um, and then just proactive steps to make sure that we're enforcing the federal law, which says we will remove your weapon from you before you do something really harmful or lethal. What we're finding is that enforcement is really, enforcement and removal are really the problems for those that have access to guns and they are, are also domestic abusers, so. Thank you. And then to, to round out this question, you know, we, we know that so many of our legislative actions have um, race implications, sexual orientation implications, um, you know, other my, religious minority um, implications. So any, any tips from folks on how to really thread the needle, ensure that we are getting the, the, the best actions we can while also um, making sure that we are are protecting communities as much as we can as well. 
I think one point on that is to look to the communities um, and listen to what people in communities that you know um, are more vulnerable are saying, just because, um, you know, you may not be situated in a community of color or um, familiar with you know, sexual minorities or religious minorities, but there are organizations out there where people are saying how we can help them and how we can be allies. And um, I think that that would be like one way to make sure that as you're using your voice, even from home, like Tatiana mentioned, um, that you're kind of taking your cues and, and learning from other people about what exactly their needs are and what their what their advocacy looks like um, and then you know asking how can I support you and how can I further that. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters for their time today. Um, I this is a, a incredibly hard time for for all of us. It's a disruptive time. We have all had to make changes in how we go about our, our daily lives. And so I really thank all of the, the panelists for joining, but all of you for participating, for realizing that just because our, our lives have changed, it doesn't mean that it is time to stop fighting gun violence and that there are things we can do from home, whether it is modeling responsible behavior and asking our, our loved ones about access to guns, or advocating for laws and policies that are gonna keep us safe, or ensuring that we are learning something new about communities that might be impacted that we haven't actually engaged with before. This is a time that we can really lean into this problem and uh, it will only be solved if we lean into it together. So I thank you all. Just a reminder that all of the resources that were shared today will be available to all of you as will a recording of this, this webinar. Um, we thank you for all your questions. If we didn't get to them, again, please follow uh, Brady Buzz and we will try to answer as many more of those as, as we can. Have a uh, wonderful day, everyone, and we thank you for being part of this fight with us.